Hi everyone, thanks for joining me today and welcome to this presentation that is going to be on some simple climate models. And this is going to be part one of a two-part series. This part is going to be on deterministic climate models and part two is going to be on stochastic climate models. So first of all, let me make clear what this presentation is about. So it is not going to be a presentation about global warming, though of course when you talk about climate models there is always some link with uh, global warming and climate change. But it is going to be about a few things that we know about what climate on the earth was in the past, how we know these things, and what we understand about the causes of climate variations and some simple models for them. Now, I feel I should also clarify my position on climate change. So I think that nowadays everyone, except maybe people who have been living in a cave and uh, have no contact to reality, will agree that climate has been changing in the last years. We've had more extreme events uh, such as uh, floods and droughts and uh, forest fires and uh, stronger hurricanes and tornadoes and heat waves and so on. Now, I understand there are still some people who doubt that this climate change is caused by human activity. So they believe that natural causes can explain these changes. Now, I'm not one of these people. I really think that there's compelling evidence for these climate changes being due to human activity, at least uh, in a large part. And it's something I'm concerned about because it already causes problems and it is going to cause more problems in the future. However, everyone is entitled to their opinion, so you don't have to believe me just because I say so. But when you, have a, you make an opinion, it's always better that this opinion is based on some facts, on some understanding, and this is why I think that it's interesting to know how scientists have been analyzing climate in the past and how they have uh, tried to model this. So one very important aspect about climate in the past is ice ages. So you may not know it, but we are actually currently in an ice age, which is called the Quaternary Glaciation. But we are in a so-called interglacial period in the, this ice age, which is known as the Holocene. So here you, you have a picture of CO2 concentration in the atmosphere in the last 650,000 years. So we are, the present is here at the right, so the yellow zone here is the Holocene. And you see that in the past there have been these periods with the, so the blue periods here correspond to uh, colder weather, the yellow ones to warmer weather, and there have been these alternations between glaciations and interglacials which are roughly periodic with a period of about 100,000 years. And this has been going on for a bit more than 2 million years. Now, during these glacial periods, large parts of the Earth may have looked a bit like this picture here, with huge glaciers uh, covering uh, the mountains and large areas around the mountains. But you may ask, how do we know this? Well, there are different types of evidence. First of all, there's evidence from geology. So these glaciers have left traces in the landscape, like U-shaped valleys in the mountain ranges, moraines and large boulders, which are far away from mountain ranges and that have been transported there by glaciers. There are also many lakes in the northern hemisphere, uh, mostly, but also in, you find them in South America, for instance. In fact, the, the, the big lakes in uh, northern America 
are thought to have been caused by by glaciations, by glaciers, as were many smaller lakes, and the same is in, uh, true in Scandinavia and in northern Asia, and actually even the Baltic Sea may have been caused by a glaciation. And also fjords that you find in Norway and in, in Chile, for instance. So a second and very important indicator of these ice ages and the glaciations uh, uh, is chemistry. So this is based on different sources. For instance, ice cores that you can extract from ice sheets uh, that you find, for instance, in Greenland and in Antarctica. And another source is marine sediments, so what is called benthic foraminifera. So benthic means from the bottom of the ocean. And foraminifera is a type of organism, so uh, it's a unicellular, unicellular organism that you find in marine plankton that lives near the, the ground of the oceans. And when these uh, life forms die, most of them fall to the ground where they are slowly turned into sediments. And so if you drill the ocean floor, you can uh, analyze the chemical composition of these sediments and it gives you some information on climate in the past. So there are different things you can measure, like uh, CO2, and one important source of information is the delta 18O. So what is this? Well, oxygen occurs mostly in its isotope 16, but there's also a small part, about 0.2%, which is in the form of oxygen 18. And oxygen 18 being a bit heavier, it is more likely to condensate and a bit less likely to evaporate. And the difference between condensation and evaporation becomes larger when the temperature is lower. So this delta 18O is defined as, so you take the ratio between uh, oxygen 18 and 16 in a sample, you divide by the same ratio in what is called standard mean ocean water at our current time, and you subtract one, and then you measure it in thousands, so you multiply it by a thousand. So when this uh, delta 18O is more negative, it means that the temperature was lower. And a third indicator for these ice ages having occurred is paleontology, so in particular fossils. So by finding fossils and dating them, you get an idea of what kind of animals lived on the Earth at different periods. And for instance, by comparing them to animals you find now, you know in what kind of climate they lived, and they, it gives you uh, an indication of climate in the past. Now it's important to see that there are these different sources and by correlating findings from these uh, different proxies you, you get a rather clear picture of what type of climate there was in the past. Now here I, I show a record for the last uh, 650,000 years but you can both zoom in and zoom out of uh, of this time series. So here's what happens when you zoom in. And I have turned this time series that comes from a glacial core. I've turned it around so that time goes from left to right. So this one goes now from 80,000 years ago to a bit less than 15,000 years ago. So the Holocene starts here at the right. And one uh, surprising and remarkable thing here is that during the last glaciation, the weather was not cold all the time. Actually, there have been repeated rises in temperature, which is which are called Danskor Oeschger events, and uh, followed by again cooling. So there's this more subtle structure on smaller time scales. And then you can also look at things on larger time scales and what's 
you, we have here is a much longer time scale of about 500 million years. And there also you see that there's quite a lot of, of variation. So we are currently in a rather cold phase, but there have been warmer phases and in particular the secondary area, the Mesozoic, that goes from about uh, 250 million years ago to uh, 60 million years ago, that's when the dinosaurs lived on the Earth, the climate was mostly warmer than today. Now, what are the causes for these ice ages? Well, there are several of them. The best known is called Milankovic cycles, and that's an idea that was first put forward by a Scotsman named James Call in the 19th century, and then it was developed uh, much more by the Serbian astronomer and mathematician Milutin Milankovic. And so the, the idea is that the ice ages are caused by periodic or quasi-periodic variations in the orbit of the Earth. So in a previous lecture I talked about the evolution of the solar system and how the orbit of the Earth changes. So its eccentricity changes, also its semi axis, its inclination, and this has an influence of the quantity of solar radiation that arrives at the Earth, and that has an impact on climate. Now, let's look at the data in a bit more detail. So, in this plot we have the first three lines are orbital parameters, so the most important is the eccentricity of the Earth in green here. But we have also the obliquity of ecliptic and the longitude of perihelion, which are angles measuring the orientation of the Earth's orbit in space. Now, if you multiply eccentricity and longitude of perihelion, you get the, the precession index uh, that is shown in red here. And you see these variations over time. And if you combine it with the obliquity of ecliptic, you get this black time series here that measures the averaged, so averaged over one or several years, insulation at 65 degrees north. And below we have these proxies coming from uh, Bentic Foraminifera and from an ice core drilling, so the Vostok ice core that comes from Antarctica. And, well, it may not be obvious at first glance, but if you stare at these curves for a while, you see that there's actually a correlation with these rises of temperatures and phases where the insulation was larger. So, this is this first mechanism, Milankovic factors. But then, when you look in more detail at these dansker oeschger events, you'll see that there's more going on. So in this plot, over the last 100,000 years, you see here the curve of uh, insulation in, uh, at 65 degrees north, and you see that the blue curve kind of its average kind of follows this red curve, but in addition there's a lot of fluctuations around. Actually it looks a little bit like the, the blue curve oscillates between two states which are at uh, two sides of this red dashed curve. Now at some point there has been a, a discussion going on among client scientists because some of them believed that if you look at these dansker oeschger events, you also find some evidence of a periodic forcing of a period of something close to 1500 years, in the sense that these warming events tend to appear at multiples of this uh, period. But uh, this is uh, very controversial, so it's not clear at all whether there's a periodic forcing. So. It's, what seems to be quite clear is that it is not related to some astronomical factor, like 
variation in the orbit of the Earth because the time scale is too short. So it's more an internal mechanism. Now, let me show you here uh, some parts of, of a movie which has been made by NASA, and you have the link here, which uh, I find quite interesting. And it's a movie of so smoke and salt and dust transported over the Atlantic Ocean uh, in the fall of 2017, which was a quite active season regarding hurricanes. So what <coughs> the people did is they took real weather data on winds, and then they simulated uh, so how these uh, material smoke, salt and dust are transported. And 2017 was quite uh, an active hurricane season. So here you see the first hurricane, uh, Harvey, that hits uh, large parts of Texas. And there's a second one, Irma, here. The third one, Jose, just behind Irma. And you see what happens here is that hurricanes form off the coast of Africa, of Senegal. And then they are mostly transported to the west. And then they can have different trajectories. And uh, depending on the trajectory, they can go into the Gulf of Mexico or follow the North American East Coast. And then at some point they are transported to uh, the east. And this is because in tropical latitudes, the dominant winds are trade winds, are easterlies. And further to the north, the dominant winds are westerlies. And here there's uh, a last hurricane, Ophelia, that had a very peculiar trajectory because it didn't go to the west at all, so it went more to the north. And because at the same time there were uh, these huge uh, forest fires in Portugal, in many parts of Europe we had uh, in this late September, early October, we, we had these very dark skies, which uh, reminded you of uh, the movie Blade Runner uh, 2049. Now, why am I saying this? Well, uh, so this is what is important to know is that we have the easterlies and westerlies. And another important thing is uh, the so-called thermohaline circulation. So the thermohaline circulation is a complex system of currents in the ocean, and some of them are close to the surface or at the surface, and other them, others are much deeper down in the ocean. They can go all the way to the bottom of the ocean. So in this picture, you you see the most important of them. So the red parts are at the surface and the blue parts are much deeper. And so what does thermohaline mean? So thermo comes from heat. So it means these currents are driven by temperature differences and haline comes from salt. And so they are also driven by salt differences. And you see the colors here in the ocean indicate the salinity. So the light green yellow parts have a stronger salt concentration than the blue parts. Now, if we focus on what happens in the North Atlantic, so we had these uh, westerlies, and here's part of the thermohaline circulation called the AMOC or Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation. So part of it is the Gulf Stream, which is mostly driven by these westerly winds and that brings a lot of warm water to the North Atlantic. And then it continues in uh, several currents. The main one is called the North Atlantic Drift and these currents then uh, splits into several smaller currents, some of them going into the Barents Sea and uh, others going more towards uh, Labrador. And the important thing is that there are some points where this current finally 
leaves the surface of the ocean and goes down to the depth of the ocean and then flows back to the south near the bottom of the ocean. And it turns out that the points where this occurs are very sharply located. So there are a few rather small areas off the coast of Greenland where uh, these, uh, these currents sink down to the bottom of the ocean. And it is believed that in the past, sometimes this, uh, this mechanism, and uh, so this AMOC, actually went much less to the north. So, as you see on the bottom picture here, when this warm water stops at a lower latitude, it means that, for instance, Iceland is actually in the uh, Arctic ice sheet, and uh, as is the, the coast of, uh, of Great Britain uh, and Ireland. So, how do we know that? Why do people believe that these two states exist? Well, one reason is that you find a lot of rocks and gravel and boulders on the bottom of the ocean, which are assumed to have been transported by the ice sheet or by icebergs coming from the north. And you can again date these, uh, these rocks and depending on their age, you can uh, know when they fell to the bottom. And depending on how far the ice sheet went to the south, they uh, reached the bottom at different places. So that's, that's one reason. So scientists believe that the, the AMOC has several times switched between these two states. So the excited state called interstadial that we have today with more heat going to the north and uh, the basic or stadial state with less heat going to the north. So now let us talk a little bit about mathematical models for these phenomena. And first of all, here's a general statement on what it means to do mathematical modeling of a physical system. So here I've taken an example which is a, a jet engine, but you could replace it by anything uh, that is modeled by physics, for instance a climate system. And my engine here is a very complicated piece of machinery, but you can in principle describe what happens by using some physical laws, so typically Newton's laws or some consequence of Newton's laws or maybe some other physical law depending on, on what you describe, and it means that you get some equations describing them. But these, ex these equations are very complicated and you can't usually analyze them mathematically, so what we do nowadays is that we use computers to simulate them. But it's not the only thing you can do. You can also try to simplify this model. For instance, as a first approximation, replace this engine by just maybe a cylinder with a conical part and a bunch of pieces. And then the equations are simpler and you may even be able to solve them without computers, just by doing the computation. So why is this useful? Well, for one thing, computer simulations are very nice. You can do a lot of things, but uh, they are wound of errors, or you can have made errors in uh, the model. So. The simpler model, even though it ignores a lot of details, can give you some type of validation of your more complicated model. And there's also, I call this stability, the thing is if you change just a little thing, uh, so maybe a, a duct somewhere in your, in your complicated system, in principle you have to do all the simulations all over again. But the simplified model is more robust with respect to changes. So in the simple model, you are able to make less precise statements, but on a more large set of 
systems. And here I've just put two levels, but what we actually do in modeling is there's a whole hierarchy of models from very precise ones to very simple ones and models in between. So in climate science, we have, uh, first of all, what is called GCMs, general circulation models, which are very precise models of the Earth that include the atmosphere, the oceans, land masses, ice sheets, and so on. So these are huge models that you need computers to, uh, to simulate. But then you also have simpler models. So I read about something called Earth Models of Intermediate Complexity or AMIX. So I'm not sure this acronym is widely used, but uh, I've seen it at least. And then at the other end, you have very simple box models, which are simple models where you look at the evolution of average quantities over a small number of large boxes. And for the reasons I just explained, these different levels of modeling are all interesting because, of course, you need the GCMs to have really uh, models which may be able to predict what is going on, but they, are, they use a lot of computing power. And when you have the solution of a simulation, it's not always easy to understand what's going on. These simpler models uh, give you explanations of some simple mechanisms. And now you may also wonder why should it be possible to make predictions on climate if you consider weather forecasts, for instance, well, depending on where you live, forecasts are reasonably precise on maybe one or two days, maybe three days, maybe up to a week but not much more than that. So how should it be possible to model the climate on long time sp spans of hundreds or thousands of years? Well, the thing is, if you model the climate, you don't want to know what the weather was in Paris on the 1st of January uh, 500 BC. What you're interested in is average quantities over several years. And that is a bit easier, a bit more stable, and uh, it's still hard, but the chances are larger that you can actually say something on these, uh, these quantities. Now, let's look at the simplest possible box model, which is the model with a single box for the entire Earth. And one way you can model this is to say if T is the average temperature on Earth, then the time derivative of the temperature multiplied by a constant, which is a, a specific heat, will be the difference between the incoming and outcoming radiation or energy. So the incoming radiation, this R in of T, that is a constant times some time periodic term. And let us assume for simplicity that it is periodic. Uh, as we've seen in general, it's more complicated than that. It's quasi-periodic. And one uh, important point to note is that even with all these variations in the orbit of the Earth, the amplitude of this variation is quite small. It's uh, of the order of 5 times 10 to the minus 4. And now the outgoing radiation has two terms. So the second term here, this E of T, is the radiation emitted by the Earth at all times because it's a warm body in empty space and any warm body emits radiation. And there's this uh, Stefan Boltzmann law that says that this emitted energy is proportional to the temperature to the power 4. But for our purposes and our scale, uh, this can be assumed to be almost constant. And the other term is the energy that is directly reflected by uh, the surface of the Earth. And that is the incoming radiation times a factor 
called the albedo. And the albedo depends on the temperature because it depends on the extension of ice sheets, on the cloud cover and things like that. And of course, all the complicated stuff occurring in the model is in the temperature dependence of this albedo. Now, if you plug this in the equation up here, you get here a certain equation that involves this gamma of t that is related to the albedo and other quantities. And if you make some very simple assumptions on this uh, temperature dependence of the albedo, you can arrive at systems where this right hand side here is minus the derivative of a double well potential, meaning that it has two stable equilibrium states and an unstable state in between. But also it depends periodically on time. So this at least explains to some extent why you can have two stable states for the climate. It doesn't really explain how you get from one state to the other. So to have this Either one should use a higher dimensional variant of this equation or one should add noise and that I will talk about in part two. Now, let us look at another model which is a bit more detailed but also more local, which is a box model for the North Atlantic. And it is, it is due to a scientist named Stommel. And what he said is Let's model the North Atlantic by two boxes. There's a box at low latitudes, something like the Caribbean, with temperature T1, salinity S1. And there's a box at higher latitudes with temperature T2 and salinity T2. Now, there are several mechanisms that exchange temperature and salinity. So the first mechanism is that the solar radiation is stronger at lower latitudes, so this will induce a temperature difference just due to the different uh, solar energy. Then there is a phenomenon which is a fresh water flux from low to high latitudes, and this is as we have seen in the movie before, uh, because you have more evaporation and cloud formation in the south, and then you have more rain in the north, and the rain will dilute the seawater and decrease its salinity. And a third mechanism is a mass exchange between these two boxes. So this mass exchange will depend on the difference in uh, density of seawater. And by using thermodynamics, you can approximate this density difference by some constant times the difference in salinity and uh, constant times the difference in temperature, where the differences are here. And if you put all this into equations, you get the following system. So the first equation here describes the time change of temperature difference. Actually, I could have written one equation for T1, another one for T2, and then take the difference. But it turns out that you can write everything in terms of delta T. So what this equation says is that we have a first term here, which is a relaxation term on a time scale tau r to theta. And theta is just a constant value which is what you would expect due to the difference of solar radiation in different latitudes. So without this second term here, the temperature difference would converge to theta. And the second equation is about the time evolution of the salinity difference. And it just says that you have uh, some constant times the fresh water flux so the fresh water flux will just keep increasing the salinity difference. But then we have these additional terms here, which are 
the terms coming from mass exchange between the two boxes. And they are proportional to delta t in the first equation and to delta s in the second equation because, well, if the temperatures are equal, you can exchange as much mass as you want, you will not change the temperatures. And now we need a model for how the mass exchange depends on this density difference. And Stommel used one model and there's another other later model due to Paola Cessi that uses this form here and it says that even if the density difference is zero, there is a certain mass exchange on a time scale tau d. And then when the difference in density increases, also the mass exchange increases in a quadratic way. So this is our system of equations. Now, what we do in mathematics is that we try to get rid of as many constants as possible in this model. And this is uh, something called non-dimensionalization. So let's introduce dimensionless variables x and y. So x will be proportional to temperature, but I take the temperature difference over theta, which is also a temperature. So this is now non-dimensional. And you can do something similar for salinity. So y is proportional to delta s, but non-dimensional. And also I can scale temperature by, for instance, this slow time scale for mass exchange. And another observation is that in practice, in practice, the relaxation time scale of the temperature difference is much shorter than this time scale of mass exchange. And therefore, you introduce a small number epsilon, which is the ratio of these time scales. And when you plug this into the system I've shown before, what you get is this system here. So now we have two dynamic variables x and y and a bunch of parameters. So epsilon is the timescale separation, mu is proportional to the freshwater flux, and there's an additional parameter eta which we will take constant here. And one observation is you, it's now possible to analyze this system of ordinary differential equations in detail. But since epsilon is small, we can even simplify things. And you observe that if you put epsilon equal to zero, you get the equation zero is equal to minus x minus one, and the solution is x equals one. And so what you are tempted to do is to say that you just replace x by one. And this is indeed justified for small enough epsilon uh, due to the special structure here because actually x equals one is uh, what is called a stable slow manifold of the system. So if we do that we end up with an even simpler ODE which is now one dimensional for y which is proportional to the difference in salt but also related to the mass exchange. And it's this equation here. And now in particular, we can look at equilibrium states. So equilibrium state means that this quantity here, y times this bracket should be equal to mu and mu is this parameter which is proportional to the fresh water flux. And y times the bracket, that's a cubic function, which looks like this here. And it depends on uh, the value of, of eta, but for realistic values of eta, which are something around 7.5, I think, you get this S-shaped curve of equilibria. And that is interesting because it means that there are three different cases. So for intermediate values of the freshwater flux, you have three equilibrium states. And you can show that 
the middle one is unstable and the outer ones are stable. So there are situations where our system has two different stable states, which somehow should correspond to these stadial and, and interstadial states, even though the model we use here is very much simplified. So you should really add more boxes to get something a bit more realistic. But nevertheless, we have these three states for intermediate values of the freshwater flux. And then for high freshwater flux, we have a, we have a strong uh, state with a lot of mass exchange. And for low freshwater flux, we have a state with a weak freshwater, uh, a weak uh, mass exchange. And these points here and here are called tipping points. So one scenario you can imagine is, let's say today we are in this interstadial state with a strong exchange, a strong AMOC. And then let's say that for some reason due to climate change, the freshwater flux decreases. Then at some point, this uh, strong uh, state, stationary state, no longer ex exists, and so the system will go down to uh, this other state here. Now, what scientists thinks, think happens in the AMOC is a little bit different. It's, it has more to do with warmer weather causing more melting of ice on Greenland, and this melting of ice will dilute the water and therefore decrease its density and uh, therefore decrease its tendency to sink. So it's a somewhat slightly different mechanism than here, but you could also describe it by such a simple box model. Now, one important thing about this uh, S-shaped curve is, well, we have by stability, we have tipping points and we also have hysteresis. So hysteresis you have, for instance, in uh, magnetic materials, where the magnetization depends on the external field, but it also depends on the history of the magnetic field. So you can start with a positive field, and then you have a positive magnetization, and then the field can decrease, even take slightly negative values, and your sample has still a positive magnetization. And that is the mechanism that is used in many magnetic storage devices, like uh, magnetic tapes, for instance, or older versions of hard drives. Now, here we have a similar hysteresis phenomenon, where, you see, as I said, if we start with a situation where we have a strong AMOC, and then we decrease this forcing term, this flux. At some point, we get this weaker AMOC. But if we want to get back again to the strong state, we have to increase the parameter f more to reach another tipping point here. So you see that you have some transformations which are kind of irreversible in the sense that it is not enough to go back to the former state to re-establish this former state of operation of the system. You have to go to a higher parameter value. And there's another example of hysteresis and climate systems, which I find interesting. That is about ice sheets. So let's assume here we have an ice sheet, for instance, on Greenland or in Antarctica, and Glaciers are uh, formed in the following way. So you have a certain altitude, which is the average limit between rain and snowfall. Of course, it changes over the year, but that's an average. And above this altitude, precipitation occurs in the form of snow. And the snow accumulates on the glacier and it gets compressed and slowly transforms into ice. And then when the ice is compressed a lot, it gets a little bit fluid, and so it flows down. And then it reaches 
regions where the temperature is higher and it starts melting. And if the climate is stable, the glacier will reach uh, an equilibrium state after some time. But now let's assume that the temperature increases, so the limit between rain and snow rises. And now the, the glacier or the ice sheet will decrease everywhere. And so it will become smaller. And even if the limit between rain and snow goes back to its initial value, it may not be sufficient for the ice sheet to grow again. So it has to go even lower for the glacier to have a chance to grow again and to go back to something like the previous state. So this is about these uh, rather simple models and some mechanism we have in climate evolution. Now getting back to global warming. So one thing you may think after what I told you here is that, well, climate has changed in the past. So could the current climate change be due to natural causes? And the thing is that this is very unlikely because just of the sheer amount of temperature change. So here, for instance, you have a uh, reconstruction of the average temperature on the globe in the last 2000 years. And there has been, there have been warmer and colder periods. There has been a period around 1000 to 1200 where the weather was a bit warmer and uh, historians believe that that was the period when Vikings or Norsemen colonized parts of Greenland and where they were able to grow crops. But later the climate became colder and uh, so people were no longer able to, to grow crops on Greenland anymore and uh, the settlements disappeared either because the people left or because they simply died. And there was a period around 15 to 1800, which is called the Little Ice Age, which was a bit colder. And that's, for instance, the period where we have all these pictures by Bruegel of people skating on the, the canals in Amsterdam because the, winter, the winters were colder. But then since about so the end of the 19th century and all the 20th century, you have this very sharp increase in temperatures. And it's really quite important compared to what happened before. And in fact, too important to be reasonably explained by just natural causes. And here's another version by Wendell Munro and on XKCD. So it's a very large comic. I could just fit the, the last part here, but where he gives an uh, evolution of temperature over also, uh, I think, the last 2000 years. And you also see that the recent raise in mean temperature is really quite enormous compared to what happened before. And here I, I'd like to recommend some, some reading, which some books I, I liked. So there's a of course, it's fiction, but it's well-written fiction, and it's also interesting because uh, several of the main characters in these novels are scientists, so it also tells you something on how science works. So it's, uh, there's a trilogy by Kim Stanley Robinson, who's mainly known for his books uh, Red Mars, Green Mars, Blue Mars, but he has also among other books written this trilogy, 40 Signs of Rain, 50 Degrees Below, and 60 Days of Counting, which I really like a lot. I've just finished reading it for the at least third, maybe fourth time. And he has also written this more recent novel called The Ministry for the Future. That one I've just started reading, so I can't tell yet whether I like it, but it seems quite promising. And I think it is... Uh, uh, well researched, interesting account on what may happen due to the ongoing and uh, uh, still increasing climate change we observe. 
So that's all for today. My next talk will be on some stochastic models, or so models where I add random stochastic influences in, in these models. And uh, thanks a lot for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. So hope to see you soon again. Take care. Bye.